Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program featuring reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is sponsored by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Bishop David Bonner from our series, With the Father's Heart. We will also hear more about the life of Saints Isidore and Maria della Cabeza and the readings for this first Sunday of Advent. That and more on Wineskins. From the First Friday presentation, we now will hear from Sheila Triplett. With me today is Sheila Triplett, who is the Director and CEO of MICAP, which stands for Mahoning Youngstown Community Action Partnership. Sheila, it's such a pleasure to have you on Wineskins today. It is my pleasure to be here. You know, you're here for the First Friday Club, and I'm just amazed at how important the topic that you're talking about today is. And I'd like you to share just briefly why your topic is, why Black Lives Matter in this historical perspective. You know, it's really important to speak about Black Lives Matter, especially from a Christian perspective, Mm -hmm. because really it's something that shouldn't need a lot of conversation because we're all created in God's image. And that should be how we present ourselves to each other and to the world. But we know that's not what's happening now and that there has to be this emphasis on the fact that, you know, young African-American men and women, there's been an increase in hate crimes among four African-American men and women. So we need to have that conversation because I think what's lacking is just the conversation. You know, have that real dialogue about race. And sometimes that's an uncomfortable thing to do. But for us to grow, for us to change as a church and change as a country, I think we have to have that conversation. You know, when we talk about the sin, and I like to refer to it as the sin of racism, you know, oftentimes these things are generational. We don't grow up understanding that that's a sin. Mm -hmm. And yet many people grow up with so many myths and misunderstandings. Why is it important for us that when we talk about Black Lives Matter that we do so within this context of understanding who we are, especially as church, but who we are as human beings. Because I think it's important that we get beyond the rhetoric, you know, beyond what you see and you hear on TV and to see each other as people who have more in common than we have that makes us different. But it's the differences that we have to recognize and respect. And I think that is where sometimes the issues come in, because there are real differences. There's cultural differences. There's ethnic differences. And those are important, and they need to be respected and recognized. And you can only do that with some honest dialogue and conversation around those issues. You know, you use words like respect and conversation. And unless we have those, unless we're disposed in a positive way, then we really are not open to those discussions or or open to respecting other people. What can we do? What can the people that are listening today do for themselves to be more open and respectful of one another? You have to expose yourself to people from other cultures. I mean, if you have some African-American friends, you know, have an honest conversation with them. Ask them how they feel. Ask them how they're being affected by what's going on in this country. You know, what I say to my white friends is, you know, when I say to you that many times I feel afraid and many times I fear for my children, then believe me, don't try to fix it and tell me a situation that you dealt with that was similar to what I'm experiencing. Just listen, because I think that's what most of us want. We want to be heard. We want you to understand it. It's a little different for us. You know, historically, the Black Lives Matter movement really is very young, I would guess 2013. But yet the problem of racism is so old and Mm -hmm. goes back to the beginning of time. How do we bridge that? How do we kind of understand that this is something that's new, but something that is addressing a very old issue? You know, there's going to have to be some institutional change. And I am so happy when I see young people 
you know, they don't come with the same baggage that my generation came with Mm -hmm. about race. And so I have a lot of hope that they will be the ones that finally figure it out because they, you know, have not been used to dealing with the sort of racist situations that may have happened in my generation. So they're looking at it in another way and they're coming up with solutions that I think that will be some real institutional changes that will help us to move forward and move past all of this finally. Sheila, what I'd like you to address very briefly is how do people who live in fear with whatever the problem or the fear is, how do we get beyond that? How do we try to get beyond that? I think you have to have someone in your life whom you can talk to, Mm -hmm. someone that you can share that fear with, someone who understands the root of all of that. So I think a lot of the healing comes in the conversation. It comes through the relationship. And the relationship gives you the the security to be able to express your fears and not hold them in. Sheila Triplett, CEO of MyCap. I am so glad that you were able to spend some time with us here on Wineskins. And we thank you for your presentation at the First Friday Club. And we wish you well and God's blessing, especially in your work, which is so important and so powerful. Thank you so much, Father, for having me here. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. Married saints Isidore and Maria della Cabeza were holy peasant farmers. To tell us more about them, is Ron Puhala. He is from Holy Family Church in Poland. In 1622, Pope Gregory XV canonized five saints. One of them was Saint Isidore, a farmer and a married man. He is known as one of the five saints in Spain. He's patron of Madrid, Spain, as well as of farmers. He was born in Madrid in 1070 to parents so poor that his only inheritance was their plow. He was named for another Isidore, the renowned and learned 7th century Bishop of Seville, Spain. While still only a boy, barely old enough to wield a hoe, Isidore entered the service of John D. Vergas, a wealthy resident of Madrid, as a farm worker on a large estate outside the city. Isidore lived and worked on that estate for the rest of his life. He married a young woman known as Maria de la Cabeza, the daughter of other farmers just as poor as Isidore's parents. Isidore and Maria lived a holy life while fulfilling the vocations to which God had called them, a simple farmer and his wife. They had only one child, a son, who died while he was still a child. Isidore is known for nothing more than for leading a life of hard work, fervent prayer, and lavish charity despite his poverty. He began each day with Mass in one of the city's churches and all day, as he walked behind his plow or performed other farm chores, he talked with God, his guardian angels, or the saints. On public holidays, he would visit the churches of Madrid and the neighboring districts. It was said of him, In life his hand was ever on the plow, his heart ever blessed with the thought of God. Isidore's practice of going to daily Mass aroused some resentfulness on the part of his fellow farm laborers because they told John D. Vergas it made Isidore late for work. When confronted with this complaint, Isidore admitted that he was sometimes late for work, but, he said, I do my utmost to make up for the few minutes snatched for prayer. And if you compare my work with that of the other plowers, you will find that I have not defrauded you. This explanation did not satisfy De Vergas, so he decided to keep a close watch on Isidore. One morning, he hid himself near a field where Isidore and other workers were working. Isidore was late, even later than usual, but started to plow the field walking behind his plow and oxen. De Vergas began to get angry and was starting to leave his hiding place to confront Isidore when he stopped in astonishment. He could see plainly two angels, one on either side of Isidore and each with the plow, helping their companion make up the work lost while in prayer. Isidore's generosity for the poor became well known. He frequently shared his simple meals with them usually eating the scraps they left behind. Isidore was also known for his love of animals. 
Isidore's feast is celebrated on May 15. In 1995, the bishops of the United States approved the addition of St. Maria de la Cabeza to the liturgical calendar. Their commemoration provides the calendar with laypersons who are also a married couple, a category which is presently lacking in the calendar. St. Isidore is the patron saint of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference. For Wineskins, I'm Ron Puhala. with Bishop David Bonner on his pastoral letter, Testify to the Light. You know, Bishop Bonner, one of the beginnings, once we get through the illusions and the images of darkness and light, is a sacramental life of the church in your pastoral letter. That's really a, the bulk of it in the beginning. Why is it so important for us as Catholics to focus on the sacramental life of our church? We know the sacraments are very important, but why should we do that at this point? Well, I think what really engendered this reflection on the sacramental life is the context of where we are and where we have been. We've been in this pandemic and because of the pandemic we've had to embrace modifications in our lifestyle but also in the way we practice our faith. The obligation for Sunday Mass and Holy Days has been lifted and certainly that was done to keep people safe and protect them and people have watched and entered into the, the sacred mysteries virtually. They've listened to it on the radio. Some continue to come to Mass, but there was a time when there weren't any Masses. And so this has been a year now, and I think the danger is that we can so easily take for granted the essence of our sacramental life. And so I felt compelled as the bishop using this tool called a pastoral letter to invite some reflection on the sacramental life so that we do not forget just how precious it is the way we live our lives and to our lifestyle. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, one thing that came to mind is the comments that I hear from Catholics that have not been going to church who very faithfully went every weekend. And there, there's still this obviously pandemic fear that's present, but obviously as that wanes down the road, hopefully God willing, that they'll feel a need to go back to church to be fed by the Eucharist. And that's really the basis of it all, isn't it, for us as Catholics to be fed by the Eucharist, even though people watch it on television or listen to it on the radio or watch it on their iPad or cell phone. There's this need within us to be present within this community, to be fed not only in the Word, in the Eucharist, but with one another. So that whole communal aspect of the sacramental life is really important for Catholics. And those Catholics that haven't been going, but normally went, we want to encourage them strongly to go back to church. Absolutely. And I appreciate what you say about the community, because that's been hard to identify with in this time of pandemic. But there's also the element of celebration, which, as you know, has been scaled back. Hymnals have been taken out of churches. There's been very limited singing. And all the customary celebrations have been kind of put on the back burner. It's like the brakes have been put on. And I know there's a fatigue factor. I know that we all feel it. We're all ready to just yeah. get back to normal. But there's also great fear, I think, that remains in, in people's minds and hearts as to sure. what, what this is all going to mean in the future relative to the pandemic. And my hope and prayer is that people will all come back. I'm, I'm hearing from our priests that the mass attendance is increasing every week. So that's good news. It is. And I think that kind of gives us a little segue into the next portion of your pastoral letter, and that's the parish life. It's really kind of a microcosm of the great church, the greater church. Why is parish life so crucial for us as Roman Catholics? Well, parish life is really the fountain of grace. That's where the sacramental life unfolds. That's where we experience that sense of community and celebration. And that's where we are supported. We know that the journey we're walking, we're never alone because we come to mass and there's people there around us who have their own crosses just as we do. I think one of the most beautiful poignant images for me happens every Sunday when that processional cross leads the procession into the sanctuary 
and that cross remains in the sanctuary. And then at the conclusion of Mass, that same cross leads us out into the church, back into the world. That cross is not only reminiscent of Christ's love for each and every one of us, but I think it also symbolizes the crosses that we bring with us to church, seeking strength and grace. And there's something amazing that happens through God's Word, through His sacrament. The crosses, we are strengthened, we are revivified, and we go back out into the world with those same crosses, but we're renewed in faith, and we're renewed in knowing that we are not alone. We are a community of believers. And thinking about those Catholics who have sat at home alone throughout this pandemic, throughout this darkness that we found ourselves in, when they come back to full parish life and communion again, won't that onus on the pastor and the staff and, and the people in general be great to help pick them up again because of those crosses, as you had mentioned, that, that they've carried through almost a year. How important that will be. Without a doubt. And I know that in many parishes, even as we speak, there are committees that have been formed by pastors to talk about the future, to talk about re-engagement, to bring people back into the fold, and to make sure that no one is left behind. Recently, I mentioned to one of the deacons who was serving with me at one of the parishes that I helped at. And when we came into the sacristy after Mass, I said, you know, the one thing that I really miss is greeting people after Mass. I mean, it's almost so perfunctory. It's almost like we've gone back to the old ways. Many of us don't remember those old ways, but it was a time where you came, you said your prayers, you left. There was no interaction. We've missed that. We've missed that greeting of one another. And that is so crucial for us as, as Catholics, but also as human beings, you know, to have this contact. And so as parishioners and as Catholics look forward to reuniting to their parish soon after this pandemic has ceased. What would you like to tell the priests that are with us what their role could be? Well, first of all, I would want to thank them because the work that they've done along with their staffs has been heroic and they continue to be present to their people as much as they can be present. So I would certainly want to thank them. Secondly, I would want to continue to encourage them to do what they're called to do, to be a shepherd of Christ, to guard their flock with a shepherd's care. But the third thing I would do is I would tell them to make sure they're taking care of themselves. I think that self-care is so critical. What good are we for others if we don't take care of ourselves? And so I think it's imperative that every priest needs to make sure they're taking a day off, that they're making their annual retreat, that they pray, that they exercise, that they eat right, that they do everything they, they can to lead a whole and balanced life. To receive more information and to to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Many sisters, brothers, and religious order priests served for little pay, and now their communities lack retirement funds. I spent 34 years as a teacher. I just loved interacting with the students. Gifts to the Retirement Fund for Religious help provide for medications, nursing care, and more. An annual collection is held in parishes across the nation. I always remember you in my prayers. Please give to those who have given a lifetime. Visit retiredreligious.org. By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service. Our song today is by Lorraine Hess. It is from her CD entitled, Child of God.
Our scripture reflections for this first Sunday of Advent will be by Father Matt Rorig. He is from the Society of St. Paul in Canfield. As we begin the season of Advent, a season to prepare for the celebration of the birth of Christ, the Church reminds us that we are not only preparing to celebrate a most important feast, but that we also must be preparing for Christ's second coming. His coming in the past is certainly important, but it will do us little good if we do not welcome him into our lives in the present through prayer and faith, through the sacraments and the Holy Spirit. He also comes to us through one another, and that he told us what you do to the least of my brothers and sisters you do to me. But that's not all. He will come to earth a second time in unmistakable glory to gather his faithful followers to himself. For many, the second coming will be a day of fear and trembling. They will find themselves trapped because they will be unprepared. For those who have been faithful to him, it will be a day of joy. His faithful followers are to stand erect and raise their heads, for the redemption is at hand. Christ coming to us over 2,000 years ago is truly an event worth celebrating. But our culture focuses more on the celebration itself than on the reason we are celebrating. Jesus' words in today's gospel certainly hit home today when he tells us, Be on guard lest your spirits become bloated with indulgence and drunkenness and worldly cares. Make some time to reflect on what Christ's coming means to you. St. Paul tells us we are to increase and abound in love for one another. I remember one Christmas Eve when a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society came to a church rectory late in the day to pick up food for a needy family. He had been delivering gifts and food all day, and being very tired, he said, I just can't get into that Christmas spirit. I thought he had more of the Christmas spirit than I saw in 99 other people. St. Luke also has a suggestion on how we can use the next three and a half weeks preparing for Christ when he tells us, Be vigilant at all times and pray. Prayer and good works. Can anyone recommend a better formula to use the season of Advent to one's best advantage? I like cards, I like ornaments and gifts and parties, but nothing will prepare us spiritually for Christmas any better than prayer and good works. For preparing for Christmas is in reality preparing for Christ and for Christ's coming in the past, in the present, and in the future. And don't say, I'm busy now. I'll prepare in a more spiritual way later. Now is the moment of opportunity. So let me end with a little poem which you may have heard before. It's entitled, Today. I shall do much in the years to come, but what have I done today? I shall give out gold and princely sum, but what did I give today? I shall lift the heart and dry the tear. I shall plant a hope in the place of fear. I shall speak with words of love and cheer, but what have I done today? I shall be so kind in the after while, but what have I been today? I shall bring to each lonely life a smile, but what have I brought today? I shall give to truth a grander birth, and to steadfast faith a deeper worth. I shall feed the hungering souls of earth, but whom have I fed today? For Wineskins, I'm Father Matthew Worry. Advent is a season that makes demands on our attentiveness. It is a time for us to pay attention to the ways in which the divine beckons us. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY 
the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a blessed Sunday. And we of CTNY want to extend our blessings to our sisters and brothers in the Jewish community as they celebrate Hanukkah. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to PovertyUSA.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.